So let's pray and let's study the text. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for this wonderful book that is so deep and so rich that it never ceases to give. And Lord, I pray that as we come to it one more time now this morning, that you would bless us again as you have throughout this journey. And Lord, I pray that the truths that we've learned would stay with us not for a week or two, but for the rest of our lives. Father, I pray that these Ephesian studies will have been foundational in the history of this church, Lord. That we'll always look back to it as a time where we were grounded in your word, grounded in the truth of your gospel, of new covenant Christianity. Bless us one more time today, we pray, Lord, for your glory. Amen. Okay. So it's a few verses now at the end. We're picking up in verse 21 with the final greetings, which is typical at the end of letters. It happened at the end of letters in those days, and we see it throughout the scripture. Um, We've only got a few verses here. We'll go through them, and then as we've done that, um, hopefully we'll have some time left, and I will finish just by giving us one final survey, overview, bird's eye view of the book that we've studied. So he says in verse 21, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So these two verses deal with Tychicus. I have to say, of all the, uh, you know, in, in Christian circles, when parents have kids and they, they often like to, not always, but they often like to name their kids with Bible names, and one of the ones that hasn't been picked up is Tychicus. I think it's a great name. So I want to start a campaign. If, if you're a young couple, when you have children, I want to, I want to put my vote in for Tychicus. It, it conveniently abbreviates to Tiki, which I think is great. Just brilliant. So that's just, just a personal opinion there. But Tychicus was a, uh, one of those right-hand men who were so essential and valuable to, uh, to Paul's ministry. And what is, what is interesting, and the first thing to really note as we, as we look at this, these two verses, is in Colossians 4, um, we have, in verses 7 and 8, and you don't need to turn there just yet, but almost identical. I mean, in the Greek, there's 32 words that are identical to the two verses here. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Isn't that bizarre? The two exact same things. And there is a reason for that. And for those of you who weren't here on our very first week, and for those of you who were and have just forgotten in the last six months or so. Um, there is a deliberate reason for this and there's a connection. The book of Ephesians, right, right back at the beginning in chapter 1 and verse 1, um, all your English Bibles will say to the saints who are in Ephesus. But in the original, the word Ephesus wasn't there. It, it is as if the, the book was, was given, or certainly there are some copies that were given that had the sort of in, and then the word was left blank. And I think the reason for that is something that those of us who've been here for, for all these months and have been through these Ephesian studies should be clear, in that Ephesians is a very different book to most of Paul's letters. When, when Paul wrote the book of Galatians, which many people believe was his first letter, and everybody agrees is one of the first, he's dealing with a specific problem in the churches of Galatia. He's dealing with a particular false doctrine, a false gospel, no less, that is affecting the churches there. And so everything is very deliberately targeted at that. And though there are general truths, they are there to, as arguments to buttress his, his defense of the gospel. When he writes 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, very personal books to a church he was personally acquainted with that had specific problems. And even in the book of Romans, which has this in-depth 
exposition of the gospel like no other book. Even there, there are indications of specificity to the Roman church and the problems that they were going through. And the exposition of the gospel is there for that reason to deal with those issues. But Ephesians isn't like that. Ephesians is, in short, the summary of Paul's Christianity. The gospel that was uniquely revealed to him. How that fits into the Old Testament background. Where we now stand in the new covenant. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. All of these things that we've seen through Ephesians. It is a general statement. And without going into long-winded arguments to try and justify and explain, my best understanding of Ephesians is that this is not like 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, a letter that was written at a time of urgency to deal with a problem. But this was Paul's magnus opus. This was his great work. This was the book that would summarize his understanding, his ministry. And it was something I think he probably worked on, not for weeks, not for months even, but perhaps even for years. It's something that had been he'd been chewing over and he'd been, been working on for a period of time. But what happened was at some point, at some point in writing Ephesians, news came to him from Asia Minor. Now Asia Minor is the area, you know, modern day kind of Greece and Turkey and that kind of area, where, where the, the, um, um, the Ephesian letter, what we call the letter to the Ephesians, was going to be circulated around those churches. And while he's probably about finishing it off, almost probably um, providentially, as he's coming to the end of it, word comes to him of a heresy that is spreading around the church at Colossae. Word comes to him about a heresy, a false teaching. And when we come and teach Colossians in the new year, we're going to look at this heresy and we're going to look at what he said in response to it. And so news of it comes. May have come from uh, Epaphroditus, may have come from... Um, Onesimus, who we'll talk about in a minute, but um, words came to him about this heresy. And so what he did is he wrote the letter of Colossians, probably fairly quickly, he wrote the letter of Colossians to deal with that problem in the church at Colossae, okay? But all he's been doing for months and months and months is just going through Ephesians, refining it, going through his arguments, going through his system. And so Colossians has echoes of Ephesians right the way through it. Similar phrases, sometimes identical phrases, similar concepts, same sort of teaching. And and what Colossians does as a result is as if Paul has said, here is Christianity, the summary, here's Ephesians. And then here's a problem in Colossae. Let's take those principles and apply them to this specific situation. And so for us as a church, Colossians is going to be a great next step. Because we're not kind of leaving Ephesians behind completely. We're building on that foundation and we're going to see all the lessons that we've learned in Ephesians reaffirmed to us as they're taught to the specific situation of the church at Colossae. And many of the issues that they dealt with there are issues that are very, very um, prescient, very topical, very relevant to the church today. And so we will be going through Colossians and we'll do that. The other thing that probably happened at about the same time is a guy came to him called Onesimus. Now, Onesimus, if you haven't heard of him, he comes from the book of Philemon, or Philemon, as as I believe you guys typically say. And Onesimus was a slave. And he was a slave, um, and we talked about the slavery of the Bible and how different it was when we did it in Ephesians 6. And so he he was someone who had made that uh, commitment, perhaps due to poverty or what have you, to come under the headship and the home of uh, Philemon. And... Philemon was a Christian guy, and Onesimus must have got some sort of input regarding the faith, but he himself wasn't a Christian. And what he did at some point was he fled from his master's house, which was illegal. And not only did he flee, he robbed him too. Took a whole bunch of his stuff and left and went away by himself. And on his travels, he bumped into someone. We're not sure exactly who. Maybe it was... Uh, Epaphroditus as well, maybe it was uh, Tychicus, 
Uh, maybe it was Paul himself, but someone he bumped into shared the gospel with him and he ended up meeting with Paul. And it's a great lesson for us. And maybe we'll do Philemon. We need to do it in this whole kind of section. Maybe we'll do it before Christmas. Maybe we'll do it after Christmas or maybe after Colossians. But at some point we'll do it. But what Paul said to Onesimus is, this is fantastic that you're saved now, but you robbed this guy and you're his servant and you need to go back. And so that's what he did. But he went with a letter from Paul to Philemon saying, Please be gentle. Please forgive this repentant slave. And uh, getting a letter with, from Paul is kind of like the Christian equivalent of that era of going back with a letter from the president, I guess, or something like that. It was a, a pretty powerful thing to go back with. Uh, it had a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight to it. And so uh, the, the letter that Paul sent with Onesimus is the letter of Philemon. Now, why do I tell you all of this background? Because the reason that Colossians 4, 7 and 8 and the reason that Ephesians 6, 21 and 22 are almost identical is because Tychicus came with all of these letters at the same time. He would have been delivering them all. We, we know for almost certainly that um, Philemon was attending the church in Colossae so he could have dropped that letter off at the same time. But he came and he delivered these letters together. So this is what happened. He came with this letter of Ephesians, which he brought, and it would have said in, and then no, no Ephesus, not to the, the saints who are in Ephesus, but just in, no Ephesus. And they would have had that letter, and copies would have been made. They needed to see the original, because it was from Paul. He, typically, these last few verses, probably Paul would have written in his own hand. The fact that Tychicus had brought the letter was testimony that it was from Paul himself, so there was no risk of any forgery or anything like that. And this original letter would have been read to the church at Ephesus. Now, Paul was in Rome. Tychicus was with him. Tychicus comes from Rome and travels to Ephesus. It's the port of entry into the region of Asia Minor. So Tychicus comes with these letters. Gosh, could you imagine being on that journey and having those letters with you? So, you know, have you ever been to the bank and taken out a large amount of money in cash? You've, you've probably never been robbed in your entire life, but walking down the street home or walking back to where you've parked your car, it seems like the longest time ever. You're just convinced that because you've got money on you now, someone's going to rob you. You imagine traveling that huge journey in those ancient days with a letter from Paul. The fact that he tells them to read the letters in the other churches means, to my mind, there's no doubt that Paul knew that what he was writing was scripture. I think with some of his other letters, he probably didn't. But I'm pretty sure he did here. Because he asked for these letters to be, he asks, uh, we'll see in Colossians, he asked for the letter to the church at Colossae to be read in other churches. And so you're carrying those letters with you. My goodness, what a, what a treasure you've got with you. So he comes to Ephesus, that's the entry to Asia Minor, and he give, it is also the largest of the churches in that region at that time. And so he, he takes Ephesians, and he reads, or Ephesians would have been read to the church at Ephesus. At that point, they would then make a copy of that letter. And their copies would have written in them, in the gap where it says in, they would put in Ephesus. And other people making copies might not have put the word Ephesus in, which is why we have some copies that just say in without any location. Then the Ephesian church would have been the first to make copies. They'd have made the most copies because they were the largest church. And their copies would have had the best distribution because of where they were geographically. And that's why most copies say to the church in Ephesus, which is why we call it the letter to the Ephesians. Now, after... Ephesus, the next place he would go in his journey, just looking at a map geographically, is he'd have gone to the church in Laodicea. Now, most of us know about Laodicea. They, uh, they are the ones that are most heavily condemned. But what's interesting in Ephesians, um, in uh, Colossians, um, it says at the end of Colossians 4, Give my greetings to the brothers in Laodicea, to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter, that's the letter of Colossians, 
has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. In other words, when the book that we call Colossians has been read in, Coloss in Colossae, then take that letter, send that letter over to Laodicea so they can benefit from it too. And then it says this, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Now some people have thought that there was a letter to the Laodiceans that's gone missing, that, that wasn't preserved, it wasn't inspired or something. But I don't think that's the case at all. The letter of Ephesians would have gone from Ephesus to Laodicea to Colossae. So when he says, have the letter read from Laodicea, that's the book that we call Ephesians that has taken its journey from Ephesia, um, Ephesus to Laodicea to Colossae. It was intended that this letter would be this great circular letter so that everybody would be able to see it, to read it, and to study it. And that's why, it's one of the reasons why, for my first book in this church, I decided to teach Ephesians, because it is so foundational for us all. So with all that background, the, the few specifics. Tychicus is a beloved brother and a faithful minister. So he has been someone who has served alongside Paul in ministry, and um, Paul is obviously very fond of him and appreciative of him. Don't think that Paul is a polite man in this kind of regard, in that he will say nice things about people even when they're not true. You've only got to look at what he says in 2 Timothy uh, about a few unsavory people to know that he doesn't mince his words when he doesn't agree with someone. So he, he certainly valued Tychicus in the ministry. And he says that Tychicus will tell him everything. And I guess what it is, is that because this letter is a circular letter, because it's dealing with salvation, it's dealing with the faith, it's dealing with our walk, then the people at the church who love Paul will have a lot of questions about his specific situation. And Tychicus is going to be able to be there for a while. He's got to wait there for some time for them to make copies of the letter so he can take the original on to Laodicea. So he'll be there for a while and he can tell them all about what's going on with Paul. And Paul says in verse 22, I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. They simply know that Paul is imprisoned. What they don't know is that Paul is encouraged. They don't know that Paul is doing well spiritually. And as we've said so many times in this letter, Paul's heart is to be out there. He wants to be out taking the gospel to all these different places. And uh, yet God had him imprisoned so that he might write Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Philemon. So he would write these books so that we would have them even now. And so the, the message uh, from Tychicus may be, yes, he is imprisoned, he's under house arrest, but there's good things to report as well. And then he concludes, Peace be to the brothers and, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is this typical greeting at the end, and again, peace and grace that, be, that were there at the start of the letter, grace that has, has saturated the entire letter is here at the end. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And this is a nice little ending here in that um, he says, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. So to all of you saints, all of you who love Jesus, uh, grace be with you. And then the last phrase, and it's an interesting way to end the book, but the very last phrase, it literally says in the Greek, um, those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in incorruptibility. In incorruptibility. And it's possible that the incorruptibility refers to the love mentioned previously. So we love our Lord Jesus Christ, and that love is an incorruptible love. That's one possibility, and it's how most versions translate it. If that is the case, if it's the case, then what it's saying is, is that our love for Jesus Christ will never end. It's a statement of eternal security. It's a statement of what Paul said right at the beginning of the book, which is that the giving of the Holy Spirit is God's seal that he will complete the work of redemption in us all. But personally, I don't think that is what he's saying. 
although that doctrinally is no problem, it's, it's in harmony with the book. I think that the, the gap of words is too big to link back to love. I think what he's saying is, grace be with you who, who love Jesus Christ in incorruptibility. And it could mean the in incorruptibility refers to Jesus in that Jesus dwells, he lives in, he, is, he himself is incorruptible. And I think that that's better as a conclusion and summary of Ephesians. I think that fits in better with the book. Because what the whole book has been saying is, is that your faith is rested not on you, not on what you've done, not on what you think, but it's rested on Christ. And with that in mind, let's go back to chapter 1 and let's finish our Ephesian studies with one last flyover. One uh, overview of the book where we just remind ourselves of these truths. In chapter 1, after his initial greeting, and we see the grace and peace there as well in 1 verse 2. Gosh, this is going to, I'm going to talk quickly here. We're going to get through six chapters in about 15 minutes, okay? But it starts off with that wonderful statement, Blessed be the God and, fa the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And the summary statement at the start of the book was that we, um, is that God should be blessed. He should be praised because, and there's a wordplay here, because he has blessed us, he has given to us every spiritual blessing in Christ. It is a statement that summarizes <coughs> the entire book to some degree. More specifically, it summarizes um, the first three chapters, which talk about what God has done for us. But even more specifically, it's talking about the blessings that God has given us in the first, um, the first 14 verses of the first chapter. The important thing to note, <coughs> which is foundational for the entirety of the book and the entirety of our faith, is that as Christians, in Christ, that's us, we're in Christ, we are associated with Christ because of our faith in Him. That in Christ, we have been given every blessing spiritually that we require. There are huge numbers of Christians today, there are entire denominations that are set up on the premise that you, after you've been saved, need to get other blessings in addition to the blessings that you have at salvation because until you have those blessings, you're going to live a sub-Christian life. That there's this kind of dichotomy of the Christians who have and the Christians who have not. Paul knows nothing of that. Nothing of it at all. We have all, in Christ, received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now then he tells us what those blessings are. In verses 4 through 6, he tells us what that the Father chose us, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us. That God the Father, his role in our salvation is that he chose us before the foundation of the world. That's the basis of our salvation, God choosing us. Before the foundation of the world, he did it. So that we would end up holy and blameless in his sight and love. That he would, he would bring us back to how we were supposed to be in the beginning. In his presence without the hindrance of sin. That then was accomplished, verses 7 uh, through to uh, 12. It was accomplished by the redemption that we have in Christ. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. He just loves us and he poured out these riches. And at the centerpiece of the grace and the blessings that God has given us is the redemption, <coughs> pardon me, that we have from sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Absolutely central to our faith. That he set us free from the ramifications of sin for eternity and from the power of sin now. <coughs> and then, <coughs> pardon me, the role of the Holy Spirit is in verses 13 and 14, that when we were saved, when we heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, believed in Christ, we were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we inquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And each of those three sections end with to the praise of his glory because the reason the Father chose us was that he would be glorified. 
Not for us, for Him. The reason that the Son died for us was that He would be glorified. Not us, Him. And the reason that the Spirit indwells us is that God will be glorified. Now, note there at the end that the Spirit of God indwells every believer, not just some. There aren't Christians who have the Holy Spirit and Christians who don't have the Holy Spirit. All Christians have the Holy Spirit. And that becomes clearer later in the book. But that's what's being given to us. And it's because of these blessings, verse 15, for this reason, I've heard of your faith and your love towards the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering your prayers. And this is the prayer that the Father... Uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So we've received every blessing, right? There's no more blessings to have. And yet we still sin. We still fail. We're still not perfect. So if we have everything that we need, why is everything not perfect? And the answer is, is Paul is praying now because they've received those blessings He's praying that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Literally, it just means you know, spiritual wisdom and revelation. That's what's being spoken of here. That their spiritual understanding would increase. That having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, verse 18, because you've been saved and your eyes have been opened, because you can now see the truth, that's a theme he picks up in chapter 4, because you can now see the truth, he prays that we would know three things the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and the immeasurable greatness of his, of his power towards us who believe. So if you want to pray this book into your lives, if you want to pray the truths of this book, be praying that thank you for the blessings that we have, Lord, but may we understand better the hope that we have in the future, the indwelling spirit guarantees it, Looking at what Christ is going to do, he saved us so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Knowing what he's going to do is the best way of bringing transformation now. So pray that we would know better the hope that we have in the future. Pray that we would know better the riches that he's given us. You could spend months in, well we nearly did spend months, didn't we, in Ephesians 1, 3 through, uh, 3 through 14. And you could just keep on going deeper and deeper and looking at it more and more. There's such richness in the blessings that he's given us. Know it better. And thirdly, that we know the power. We would know the power that we have in Christ. That's because he's just finished the last section by talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who empowers us. And he continues and finishes off that section by talking about this power that we have in the Spirit. And the power is so great. It's the, the this Holy Spirit who indwells us, empowers us, and it's the same power, because it's the same Holy Spirit, that raised Christ from the dead. And it's the same Spirit that not only raised him from the dead in the sense of giving him life, but raised him and seated him at the right hand of the Father, where he is above all powers and all authorities, all demonic power, all of Satan and his demons, and all the spiritual powers and authority that Christ is above them all. And that same power dwells in us. That's a pretty good first chapter, is it not? This is a book worth coming back to again and again. Then, um, oh, actually, to wrap up that one chapter, almost the most amazing thing of all, is it verse 22, he ends the chapter, and what an ending. He put all things under his feet. This is all the authorities, right? And gave him as head, that's Christ as head, over all things to the church. So he's head over all things and he's been given to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. How could it possibly be that a Christian could be conned into thinking that they are somehow substandard and they need some extra blessing when we have the fullness of Christ in us? All that authority and power in the church because we are in Christ through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then, in chapter 2, he talks about us. The whole of chapter 1 is, is really not really about us. We're, we're almost insignificant. It's what God has done, and we're just the recipients. 
And the prayer is what he will do because of what he's done. And we're the recipients. But verse two, chapter 2 talks more about us. And it talks about how we were dead in the trespasses and sins. Talks about the authority, interesting in the context that chapter 1 has said that Christ is above those authorities. But before Christ, we were dead. Those authorities had authority over us. And we lived in a way that was typical of children of wrath. Um, chapter 2 and verse 3. But God, chapter 2, verse 4. Two astonishing words. <laughs> you look at your state that we were in, verses 1 through 3, and then, but God. That's the difference. That's the change. Not I suddenly had this, this awareness, or I decided to change, or I this, or I that. No, no, no. But God. God being rich in mercy because of the great love that he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And then we get the bit that we all know so well. By grace you have been saved. God steps in and he saves us by his grace, a gift not earned. And, and this is a bit that's so often forgotten, raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are in Christ. And so he is here with us and we are there with him. And all the authority that he has over the demonic realms, that we have that authority through him. And he goes on to say... Um, so that in the, in, coming, in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And so in all the ages to come, from the time it was written, so the ages, generations like ours, the riches of grace would be shown. People would see how kind God is because of how he has treated his church generation after generation after generation. And then that lovely summary, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's our faith, isn't it? No works, accomplish nothing. As Isaiah said, our righteous deeds are like dirty rags. We're not saved by works. But, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So, and this isn't a burden, this is a glorious truth. That when God the Father said, before the foundation of the world, I choose you, he chose us, Christ redeemed us, and he gave us his spirit so that there we, we could do the works that he knew beforehand that we would walk in. And it's no accident that he says at the end of chapter 2 and verse 10, beforehand... <clears throat> linking back to Ephesians 1 and verse 4, where he chose us before the foundation of the world. That links those two sections together. When he chose us, he knew he had a work for us to do. My goodness, you think how in life today, how many people go through life with a sense of insignificance and lack of value. Guys, if we are in Christ we are astonishingly valuable. Not because of us ourselves, nothing inherent within us, but God has created us specifically for the very purpose to do a work that is unique to us. Doesn't matter if you're in ministry or not in ministry. Doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. Doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a few days or for decades. Every one of us is here for a reason. What a purpose we have in Christ. Then verse 11, the book shifts. He's, he shifts from a more individual sense in which we are all saved, in which he does his work, to the more corporate sense. And he says, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by, uh, that, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You're alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. So Gentiles, before the coming of Christ, before Christ came and died on the cross, Gentiles who wanted to come to God had to essentially proselytize, convert to Judaism. <coughs> Guys, 
didn't matter if they were in their middle age or what have you. They had to be circumcised. Everybody had to take the law upon themselves. You had to essentially become Jews. The, the wall he's going to talk about was the law of Moses, this big barrier separating Jew and Gentile. You wanted to be with God. Well, the Jews had God. And you had to climb over that wall, take the law upon yourself, and essentially become like, like a Jew. Not you could become one, because that was a racial thing. Descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you would become one of them, in a sense, convert to their way of doing things. You were, you were separated. But now, verse 13 in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near. And so he talks about how the Gentiles and Jews have been brought together into this one body. The Old Testament always spoke about how salvation would go out to the Gentiles. But what it never spoke about was how the Gentiles and the Jews would become one body, one flesh. Come together in one harmonious body. It was always seen to be, well, here's the Jews, and yeah, we kind of let the Gentiles in the back door. We'll kind of let them hang around the edges. The temple in Jerusalem summed that up perfectly, in that there was the inner courts where the Jews could go, but there was the outer courts that were the courts of the Gentiles, which was as far as the Gentiles could go in. They were limited, they were held back. They were distant from the center, but not anymore. Brought near, one body in Christ. And that is something that happened, very important point, by abolishing the law of commandments, verse 15, expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man. The only way the church could exist was getting rid of the wall of separation, verse 14, the wall of hostility, getting rid of that wall and getting rid of the commandments and the ordinances. We are not under Mosaic law. If you enjoy bacon, you can rejoice. If you like, if you like shellfish, you can rejoice. You are no longer under those rules. We'll be looking tonight and when we do Mark's Gospel at some of those specific rules in the book of Leviticus in our studies in Mark. But, but uh, those, those laws have done, and as I said to you before, some Christians like to keep elements of Old Testament law. And one thing that comes clearly right the way through the book of Ephesians is this shift from Old to New Covenant. And the indwelling spirit that was there in the foundation in the beginning of chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, that indwelling spirit has that theme has continued right the way through and it will keep going through because it's central to being a New Covenant Christian. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit and we no longer are under the law of Moses. Now, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. But the Sabbath isn't. Most churches like teaching tithing, as we've seen in our studies. Why? It's convenient to the pastor, make sure he gets his income safely. It's convenient to the saints. It means they haven't got to think about giving sacrificially. They just tick the box. Do, do, the, do the easy percentage. But it's all Old Covenant. The New Covenant is different. We are to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. That isn't to say there aren't laws and rules. There are plenty of rules in the New Testament, and there's plenty of laws. But that specific set of commandments, 613 of them in total, including the 10, that were given to the people of Israel, separated Israel from the Gentiles. The very fact that we have a church, the very fact that the church exists today, is testimony to the tearing down of that wall, the tearing of the temple curtain, and the ending of the law. This is why I am a, a, key ca a keen campaigner, uh, campaigning against legalism in churches. But also, more specifically, I don't like churches that live as if we're still under the old covenant. You know, churches that teach things like generational curses, old covenant, not under the new. Churches that teach that you, you, you do what God tells you to do and, and that you'll be blessed. And if you're not blessed, it's because you're not doing what God told you to do. Old covenant. People who say, let's go to church to come into the presence of God to worship him. Old covenant. When you got up this morning and you felt lousy and you had a headache or whatever, and you got out of bed and you, uh, you were in the presence of God as much then as you are now. And if you felt moved while you were singing, well, praise God that he used your emotions to move you.
but that wasn't the presence of God. The presence of God is the Holy Spirit. People went in the Psalms, let us go unto the Lord, to his presence. That's not us, that's them. They had to go to the temple to be near the presence of God. We are the temple. The Spirit indwells us. We're, we're new covenant Christians. So that's all moved and, 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 and changed. And Paul talks about this in verse 22. He says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that makes us a dwelling place of God. And we're being built up in that. This work of us has not been completed. The church is continually being built. And that's what he says in verse uh, 20, just before that. He talks about the church being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Someone comes to me today and says, hey, I'm a prophet, and I'm telling you that God says, then my, my warning bells start going, woo, 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 in the back of my head. So if they say, I'm a prophet, I don't tend to hear the rest of it because my warning bells are going, woo, woo, because the apostles and prophets were the foundation of the church. If you live in a house, you might replace the, uh, the roof tiles. You might patch up the walls a little bit. You may even, if you have a single dwelling residence, do you call that a bungalow here? We call it a bungalow in England, a single dwelling, uh, single floor. You might put an extra floor on top. But I doubt that you're going to go and dig the foundations again when you do home repairs. Foundations are what everything is built on. The church is being built up, and it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And that, my friends, is why at this church, we make the preaching of the word central. Because this, this Bible, this ministry of the apostles and prophets, is our foundation on which we build. And it's why we do what we do. So for this reason, chapter 3, Paul says, I'm prisoner of Christ Jesus on your behalf, uh, on behalf of you Gentiles, <clears throat> assuming that you've heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. And so for Paul, uniquely, there was this revelation of mystery that, <clears throat> that, the, um, that the coming together of Jew and Gentile, it wasn't in the Old Testament, that Gentiles would be saved, yes, but coming together into one body, No. That's what a mystery is as a theological term. It's something that was not revealed in the Old Testament that's now revealed in the New. And he, makes, he mentions that word mystery three times in that section, being revealed to the apostles and prophets. And at the, <clears throat> verse 7, he talks about the gospel that he was made a minister of. And he says, To me, though I am the least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And thirdly, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So Paul has got his gospel, his ministry, unique to him, like our ministry is unique to us. And he had to preach to the Gentiles, he had to bring light, and then he says, so that the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the authorities and powers. All those demonic powers that used to rule us, beginning of chapter 2, that the church, the Jew and Gentile coming together, is a statement that God points the finger at us and says, look how wise I am, demons. That rings true, does it not, to the book of Job? where Job says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? In a similar way, he says to Satan regarding the church, he says, look at my church. Look how wise I am. What a responsibility we have as Christians. Anyhow, that's the end of uh, that whole section of chapter 3, and he concludes chapter 3 with the most wonderful of prayers, perhaps my favorite prayer in the whole of Scripture. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, verse 14, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. We have every blessing, but the Spirit who is already in us is going to strengthen us 
with power. That's the source of our power, the Holy Spirit, that we already have. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the heights and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may all be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, he wants us to keep on being strengthened. And we noted in chapter 6 when we started the parallels here with the spiritual warfare passage. He talks about strengthening, power, strength, who is able. The Spirit is the one who empowers us to continue to progress in our faith. Not that we need anything new, but what we already have is changing us by His power that we might ultimately come to know the, the height, the breadth, the depth, that we might come to know God better and better and better that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That everything that God wants to do in us and through us, that everything that God can do in us and through us, might be part of our experience. Oh boy, what a prayer. Isn't that great? That's chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to that power at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Lest we forget, he ends chapter 3 by reminding us again, it's for the glory of God. Now I'm looking at the clock, I'm going to have to pick up, so we're going to go even quicker now. In fact, chapters 1 through 3 was what God has done for us, the theology, the background, the foundation, what blessings we've had, how he's blessed us, and how we're going to grow in those blessings and be changed through this indwelling Holy Spirit, which has been central right the way through the first three chapters, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then on the basis of all those three chapters in chapter four, he says, I urge you therefore to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. And as he started chapter one by a summary statement, blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing, which he then expands upon, in the same way chapter 4 now deals with how we live in light of the first three chapters. And the summary statement is that our walk, our lives, should be a lifestyle that is appropriate to the blessings that we've seen in the first three chapters. We were dead in our sins, we're not anymore. We were far off, we're not anymore. We've been saved. We were chosen. We're going to be with him face to face one day. We, we have his Holy Spirit within us, empowering us. Therefore, we need to live in an appropriate manner to that. And he summarizes that, that lifestyle, not by saying that we should be judgmental or proud or these things that are so often associated and, and often fairly associated with Christians, but this is his summary of the Christian walk. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If you ever go far from that, you're not in the Christian walk anymore. You're not walking as you should. That is the summary of the Christian walk, right there. Now notice there the unity of the Spirit. And he hasn't left the Holy Spirit behind, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, 2, and 3. He takes this right into chapter 4, because how we live is based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He says there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Seven ones in that section. You think he's making a point, don't you? And then at the end, all, all, all. There is a sense of unity being put together here. Because we have the same Holy Spirit, the same God, the same salvation, the same baptism, we are all one. And guys, I know I keep harping on about this, but this is why it infuriates me that those type of Christians that will say, well, you're a Christian and you kind of, you got the Spirit a bit, you're kind of an indwelling Holy Spirit, but we've really got the Holy Spirit. What that does is it creates division. That's the complete opposite of what Paul's teaching. It's not similar. It's not something you can twist and manipulate. It's the exact opposite. It's like like if you've got a kid who's wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and you say, it's cold outside. Can you please put your clothes, some more clothes on so you don't get cold? And that child then takes off their t-shirt and takes off their shorts and goes out in their underwear. That's what happens when the church says, you need to receive the Holy Spirit to Christians. 
Because we have the Holy Spirit, and that's the whole basis of our unity. And what happens when churches do that? Well, what's happened over the last 150 years is the church has just gone... And division has come up in individual churches all over, separating the haves and the have-nots. The Bible says the opposite. We are all haves. We all have the Holy Spirit. That's the basis of our unity. And so the Spirit unites us, but then in verses 7 and following, he talks about the gifts being given, the apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And the same Spirit that unites us, because it's the same Holy Spirit, also distinguishes us, because though we have the same Spirit, the same Spirit gifts us in different ways. And that does not create division, because the very giving of different gifts means that we rely upon one another. I have gifts that you don't have, and you have gifts that I don't have. And so we all need one another for us to operate as a church. And as I've already said, each one of us is valuable in that whole process. Each one of us has a role to play. And so the Spirit unites us in our, in our sameness and in our diversity as well. And the reason that we're, equi- we, that we're given these gifts is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And can say it again and again and again. Your gifts are not for you. You don't come to church to be blessed solely. You don't come to church for what you can get. You're a minister. You have a ministry to do. And your ministry is there for you to give to other people. And if you don't give your gifts and they don't give their gifts, then we end up like we have in so many churches where two or three people do all the work and everybody else sits there like they're in a cinema. The church is not about that. Yes, there's a time where the teacher teaches and the saints are equipped especially in that way, but I teach so that you can be equipped so you can do the work of ministry. You know? If, if, if If I equip you and you don't do the work of ministry, then... That's defeated the entire object of you being equipped in the first place. And so that's really what the whole section of chapter 4 is talking about. And the unifying of this body in Christ, with Christ as the head. I've got to keep moving, I know. So the second half of chapter 4, the, the walk is explained then in more negative terms. Verse 17, I say this and testify in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And we see here more specifics about how the Holy Spirit works. It's all in the realm of the minds. We've already seen this uh, in chapter 1 where it talked about us receiving a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge in chapter 1. He's indicated that our growth is going to come with a growth of understanding. And that is emphasized more here. He talks about them being darkened in their understanding, um, their ignorance that is in them. And he, he talks in these kind of terms. Verse 23 We then, in contrast to those people whose minds are corrupt, we need to be renewed in the spirit in our minds. So the summary at the end there is, um, the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on your new self, created in the likeness of God and the true righteousness and holiness. In other words, we as Christians have come from a background before we were saved that we need now to put off. And that realm was in the heart. Everybody today says, follow your heart, follow your heart. And do you know what? Those same Christians that that have the haves and have nots will say, we have the Spirit now, and so we're going to listen to what he says to our heart. But the Bible says the opposite. The Bible says, don't listen to your heart, it's deceitful. The hardness of your heart. We're putting that off. We're allowing our minds to be renewed. And then we're going to put on Christ. Well, our minds are changed. That's how the Spirit changes us. He changes us in the realm of our minds. You know? There was a news story just this week of a woman who was preaching. I'll leave that one for today. But he was preaching in, in New York and becomes pregnant when she's... Um, and she's, she's not married, and she becomes pregnant, and she won't step down for ministry. And she says, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed, I'm proud of this whole situation. Well, I, I agree that we all sin, and sometimes sins are more visible than others, and we want to forgive people, and we want to encourage, what have you. But this woman just, just her whole approach was, well, I don't feel like it's bad, so it's not bad. I don't think I did anything wrong. And 
the, the reality here is this, guys. What you think is right or wrong, what you feel is right or wrong, what seems right to you is utterly irrelevant for one simple reason. You're not God. And God says, this is right and this is wrong. And so what we do is the way in which the Spirit changes us is he renews our minds so we think differently. And we don't do what our heart feels is right. We do what God tells us to do. That's what it means to walk in Christ. And so we put away falsehood at the end of chapter 4. And that falsehood that he's talking about in context is the mis not us lying per se, but it's the misrepresentation of our faith by living a way that isn't a way that we should live. He talks about being angry about that kind of misrepresentation and not giving the opportunity to the devil. And he talks about living correctly, not living incorrectly, and grieving the Holy Spirit who has sealed us for the day of redemption. If we're sinning, we need to remember that the Spirit of God within us is grieved. He mourns over our sin because we take him into the place of sin with us and we've been sealed by him because one day we're going to see God face to face. And then he re reiterates to be kind and tender-hearted and to forgive one another, which is important when you've just said, don't live this way, don't live this way, don't live this way, then the church needs to remember that for those who have lived this way, for those who have fallen in sin, there should always be kindness and tenderness to them. And then we come to chapter 5, and he talks more specifically about the, some of the things we shouldn't do in our walk, and he expands upon that, tells us not to live as one who is asleep, but to live in the light, and I'm rushing now because I really am out of time, but he concludes that whole section, comes to a crescendo by telling us to live not in a way that's foolish, to understand, it's on the mind again, understand the will of the Lord, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. Most versions say with, the Greek is emphatic that it's by the Holy Spirit. We don't get the Holy Spirit in us, he's already in us. But we are filled with all the fullness of God. That was the prayer in chapter 3, that you'll be filled with all the fullness of God. That we will be filled by means of the Holy Spirit, who is in us already, and is empowering us to live that life of fullness. And there's your summary there of chapter 5. And when we are filled with the Spirit, by the Spirit, when we are being controlled by the Spirit, when we are being changed by the empowering Holy Spirit, then it brings about a change. We address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We sing and make melody in our heart. We give thanks to God in everything. And above all else, the emphasis here is that we submit. Submitting is a way in which we show that God has our hearts. Because none of us like doing it. We all want to do what we want to do. And so submitting to God is a way in which we show that we are his. And specifically, he then deals with the family and the wives that are to submit to their husbands. And in, in the marriage relationship, there is this specific role that wives have of some, submitting to their husbands. Husbands will have to submit to God. Husbands will have to submit to their, their employers to a degree. They'll have to submit to the authorities. But within the marriage, the wife submits to the husband. And the husband has a specific duty to love his wife. Yes, the wife must love as well, but the husband in particular needs to prioritize and favor his wife and needs to love her. And if there were any commands that are hard for us, women to do. It is the command to submit. Genesis chapter 4, your desire will be for him, in the sense of ruling him. And for guys, if there's any command that's hard for us, it's to love a, a wife as Christ has loved the church. To sacrifice everything and put her before everything. No two commands that are harder for us as men and women. And why does God do this? He tells us, and this is the very important part of this whole passage. He says, he says, because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, that word again, wasn't revealed in the old, but it's now revealed in the new. That mystery is profound. Boy, is it profound. I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, <coughs> we've always had marriage in the Old Testament. We've always known what marriage is in the Old Testament. People are redefining marriage today, but we always knew in the Old Testament what marriage was. But now it's revealed why it was what it was. Why it is what it is. The whole point of marriage from Adam and Eve on was that eventually in this time of revelation it would become clear that marriage is a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Wives don't submit to their husbands because their husbands are better. They don't submit to their husbands because we live in a patriarchal society because we don't. 
so much. Wives submit to their husbands because they are playing a role, the role of the church, and the husband's playing a role, the role of Christ. And the marriage is a picture of the gospel relationship. That's why it's so important. This is Paul kind of building up a crescendo of Christian living, that the marriage relationship is showing how Christ and the church operate. There was some good stuff there, but we did that at the time, and we're moving on. And equally, he finishes off the relationship between uh, children and parents and slaves, uh, um, which, again, doesn't refer to slavery as we've had in this country in past generations, but rather refers more accurately to someone going into the military. And uh, it's, it's a willing undertaking of servanthood for an extended period of time. And then we had, which we've dealt with the last few weeks, this final passage of spiritual warfare. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We are strong in the Lord. Because we are in him and he is in us through this indwelling Holy Spirit. And when he prayed for the Spirit to fill us with all the fullness of God in chapter 3, he used the same expressions, strength, might, strengthened, able. Exactly the same repeated in chapter 6 here. And the imagery of God the warrior from the book of Isaiah is taken into Ephesians that we would know that the God who indwells us is the warrior. And that we, although we have authority over these principalities and powers are waging war against them, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work of God. And so that is what we do and ultimately we do it mostly at the end there in prayer and we pray for one another and we pray for Paul and then Paul has his personal situation and greetings at the end and that my friends is the book of Ephesians. Boy has it been a journey. I hope, I hope that what I've just done here at the end, that you can do. And I want to throw this out as a challenge to you today. I want to throw this out as a challenge as we close. Don't leave Ephesians behind. Go back, skim over it. Skim through it. And summarize it in your mind as I've summarized it. And if you can't in a particular section then go back online and get the sermons and listen or watch again and go back and fill in the gaps where you're rusty. And then when you're going through it, have the particular parts you want to look at and look at them and look at them again. Because guys, this is foundational. Everything we're going to do in Colossians, everything else, it rests on this kind of stuff. I pray that God will bless you through the book of Ephesians not just this last few months, but forevermore. I pray you know these truths. I pray they change your lives. And above all else, I pray that God will be glorified through it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this book. Thank you for this journey. Father, I pray that this book would rest in our hearts richly. I pray that that summary for those who've been week after week would just be reigniting the things they've learned. And may we grow in our knowledge and may we grow in our understanding that your spirit might work through his power in us ever more, day by day, that we might be filled with all the fullness of everything that you have for us, that that, that which you chose us for, we might walk in. And God, may you be glorified in us, we pray. Amen.